But there are still troubles here in the reeds of southern Iraq. Freedom and democracy are not going to easily arrive here on some kind of western wind. To understand the entire country's future, you need to understand what happened here under Saddam Hussein. The hallmark of his tyranny was always fear. And it goes back to just days after he took power in the summer of 1979, when he called a meeting of his Ba'ath Party leadership. Saddam announced, there are traitors among us in this room. And he called them out one by one. Soldiers hauled more than 60 men out of the room soon to be executed. Now, Historians generally recognize this plot as completely fabricated by Saddam Hussein. Yeah, This reign of terror continued for a generation. Citizens who spoke out against Saddam were ratted out by their neighbors and family, and they were tortured, some even killed. Someone was always listening to your conversations in Iraq. As for government, the entire country was micromanaged from Baghdad by the will of this one man. Every decision came from the top. The price for original thought or dissent was swift, and it was brutal. Changing that culture will take some time, but it's happening. Iraq has 18 provinces, all with their own local government. We're in Hilla, the capital of Babel province, where the U.S. Department of State and USAID are helping the Iraqis move past the era of Saddam, rooting out corruption, making sure the government is simply working for the people. Recently, they did a survey around Babel province asking these 1.3 million people what they want from their government. The people want more reliable electricity, more night guards, smart identification cards, better hospitals, and better schools. I'm Tim Bourne. I'm the USAID, USAID representative to the Babel Provincial Reconstruction Team. I've been here for two years. We bring together our Iraqi partners to just talk about what we're doing and where we're headed and make sure our programs are coordinated. This local government is trying much harder to connect to the people and to govern responsibly. I think that we are seeing improvements in Babel. I can only speak for Babel. I think things are getting better on the corruption front as well as on the governance in general front. You're stopped. But you know, Bill. You could just declare the entire country one giant archaeological site. There could be extraordinary finds that are just still undiscovered that we just don't know what they're going to be. That's next. But first, this short break. You're watching a Simon and Rock. We'll be right back. Very few American journalists have been past this locked door lately. This is the National Museum of Iraq. It's long been one of the world's archaeological treasures. Well, my name is Diane Seaver and I work for the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. I'm the cultural um, heritage program manager. Not that I'd make a big deal out of it, but she has been called the female Indiana Jones. I am an archaeologist by trade. Diane took us into the recently renovated Assyrian Hall. What you're seeing here is from a site called Dur Shurakan, or modern-day Korsabad. These massive reliefs were inside King Sargon II's palace, dating back to around 705 B.C. And what you're seeing here is the king in the middle that is taking homage um, and gifts from his people. This is ancient Iraq, Mesopotamia as it was called. Now beyond that series of bank vault type doors is this, a hallway full of hundreds of thousands of ancient items that aren't even on display yet. This is the area no one gets to see. It's behind lock and key. And there's a reason for that. Out of 15,000 artifacts that were stolen, we have restored about a third of those thanks to Interpol and other countries that have helped us. Looters raided the museum during the 2003 invasion. Uh, these are compact storage units. Seven years later, the museum and U.S. Embassy are still working to secure the human story the way it was first told. Mainly cuneiform tablets, but there are also some cylinder seals that are stored in here. The U.S. and Italian governments are paying for the restoration of the other hall and the roof. The Islamic hall here is almost complete. This is a stone altar from the Atabic period. Other countries have expressed an interest in the museum because it's not just Iraq's history here. 
it's yours as well. You have the wheel, language, astronomy, astrology was all created here. 30 minutes in a chopper, an hour in an MRAP, and a 15 minute walk gets you here. The thought of stepping in great civilizations that walked these same paths. The Lion of Babylon was supposed to protect this ancient city. Uncovered by the Germans in the early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s. But now it's up to modern day governments to preserve what's left. Like this column is original. But there's plenty of reconstruction here. You can just tell by the color, the shape, and one of the biggest problems is down here. That's water damage from below. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, all this was all underground. And as they're excavating down, they're uncovering all these incredible animal figures. To your left here, you have the original processional way. The original road from the time of Nebuchadnezzar II. Um, we're talking about 605 BC. Alexander the Great lived and died here. Hammurabi left his mark. Law codes. And then there's those Bible stories about a stairway to heaven. What the Tower of Babel actually was describing was a ziggurat. And ziggurats were um, pyramids. But pyramids, yeah. not the straight, smooth sided pyramids you think of when you think of Egypt. Um, think of more something from the South American continent of um, a stepped pyramid. Yeah. Just don't look for the Tower of Babel today. And it's gone because a lot of people took the bricks, the local people took the bricks to build oh, their yes. houses. <laughs> the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Allegedly, Nebuchadnezzar II built the Hanging Gardens for his wife who was from the, the, the Persian mountains and was missing her homeland. So he built it so she would feel more at home. There is evidence of that. But there's also um, scholars that debate that it was actually in Nineveh where they found similar structures. Now, time and heat. So it can get up to 120, 130 degrees. Are quickly silencing the past. Iraq has the potential to be one of the biggest tourist draws in the world. Think of it, Iraq, vacation destination? That's Diane's dream. Who knows what's underneath the, the ground? Most of that ground has never been sifted through by archaeologists. Now they have their chance, both down in Babylon and in the city of Ur. Hidden by centuries of sand. You know, the Iraqi government, how many years, you not know, putting walkway or fence, just PRT. Is the biblical city of Ur, <laughs> where 4,000 years ago. They call it the golden age of Ur. Through one of the oldest known archways in the world. From here to here, original. And the name of the temple, Eid Dub Lal Mah. You'll find a place where humans took a monumental leap. The, the kind of the writing here, cuneiform. Cuneiform is the second oldest written language in the world. For archaeologists, Ur is one of the digs on the planet. Look at any of the three big holy books, the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, and you'll read stories that happened right here in Ur. The ancient Sumerians lived here and worshipped the moon as a god. And why they choose the moon in Ur? Because Ur that time surrounded by water. So in the night, when looking for water, see the picture of the moon in the water at night. When looking up, see the picture of the moon up. So they thought that a great thing because they found the picture of the moon more one place. Found the picture of the moon up and they found it also in the water. Makes sense enough. Our guide here in Ur is Iraqi historian Daif Mosem. He has been involved in this archaeological dig for your whole life basically, right? Yes, sir. You may have met him when we did a live television report from the great ziggurat of Ur, one of the world's first pyramids. And it's here in Iraq. But for too many years, Saddam Hussein banned archaeologists from stepping onto this holy ground. Uh, he closed the area for years. Slowly now, it's opening to tourists with help from the joint Italian-U.S. provincial reconstruction team. The tombs, you want to see the tombs? Over there in the distance, archaeologists found the skeletons of 2,000 common people. But near the grass, the excavator found tomb of a queen called Queen Shabad. Second name, Queen Puapi. Around tomb of a Queen Shabad, the excavators found skeletons for 59 persons. Skeletons for the servant guards of the queen. King Shurgi was buried down here in the back oh, cave. On the roof of the tomb. Yeah, there's the bats, but I had another question. What happened to the servants when the king died? When the king died, the servant and the guards of him drank poison. Talk about a cruddy retirement plan. They want to die with the king. 
Those mass suicides happen up these 122 partially reconstructed steps. But the top of the ziggurat original. Now, as cool as this is, and the wind does cool things down up here, the origins of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism come back to this one house. According to a lot of scholars, this is where the prophet Abraham lived before he moved on to the land of Canaan. All those religions started right here. This says this is the house of Abraham al-Khalili, the father of all prophets. A great or holy place for all the religions. Not all Bible scholars agree on the exact location. Most of the excavators, they thought kitchen because the excavator found here a uh, smoke and he thought that here unit surface. But the evidence and the timing sure work out. 2025, 1763 years BC, that time, same time with the Prophet Abraham. Today in Iraq, there's a new generation coming up. These kids are globally connected, they're tech savvy, and uh, one other thing, they want to come live with you in your house with your kids. <laughs> That's in a moment. This is Assignment Iraq. Welcome back, Dave Malkoff in the Green Zone, Baghdad, Iraq. What do you know about Iraqis? What are they like? Have you ever met one? Well, honestly, a lot of Iraqis have never met an American family either. That is until the U.S. Embassy had this idea to send a bunch of bright Iraqi kids to the United States to live with American families. Their heads were full of stereotypes. Oh, they knew exactly what to expect of you. Or did they? I'm Harith. Uh, I'm a student in medical school. Uh, my main stay was in Montana. I've been to D.C., to New York and uh, to New Mexico. We went for six weeks of program in the U.S. Yeah, in Cleveland Rocks. Most of the Americans, they don't know Iraqi well. I mean, what's Iraq? It's like just a war zone and some crazy people, you know? They're living with uh, camels and... That's it. And what's the American people? They only like wars. All I knew about the U.S. people, about TV and TV shows, media, all those things. You know, using drugs, you know, shooting guns in the street, gang, uh, gang people, whatever. Probably America was not a very safe place. All you see is this misleading image of both sides. When we discussed more, we, fa we found out that uh, we have much things in common. Our exchange program was about leadership and community service. Actually, we uh, started to act to bring the experience we learned there back home. Like Rotary Club, something we never heard of. I mean, I, w I would never think of such a thing before. What I like about the United States is really the diversity, and exactly the food is one part of them. I, I, he I heard about sushi. We are not used to all of this kind of food. I lost a lot of money on sushi, and it wasn't good. Just raw fish. I mean, for God's sake, why you call sushi and some fancy name? I, mean. <laughs> I think the next gener generation is totally at least I'm saying I hope it will be totally different. You have internet and you have Facebook. Like when I went there, it was really different. They were like very helping and welcoming people, even though I'm an Iraqi guy. They said that their, their thinking or the image of Iraq was a little bit changed in their eyes. Well, I'd like to say that we are all people living on the same planet. It's a good thing to see when you go like out of your bubble, like I was in a bubble, and I went out, and I see like all humans are the same. All over the places, like in Iraq and in the U.S. So where do they get those crazy ideas about us? Well, you know where, from watching TV, of course, not every American teenager is Bart Simpson. You know what I've noticed? That every single place in Iraq, every home, even in the poorest slums, they all have satellite TV. Now, most of it's pirated, of course, but they are watching and they are learning. The internet can't be far behind. Assignment Iraq continues after this short break. <laughs> 